Welcome back everyone to MRI Physics Explained. Thanks to all who support this channel and a special shout out to our T2 Star members. Please consider liking and commenting on the videos if you find them helpful. Click the subscribe button so you know when new videos are released and check out our memberships for other ways to support the channel with a few bonus perks. We're going to continue our discussion on the spin echo family of sequences and today we're going for the gold. As a quick recap, we started by developing the standard spin echo sequence, the pioneering sequence of all MRI physics. But we came to a crushing realization in that we would have to repeat this process at minimum 128 times to make a picture for a single slice of the body. Not good for our imaging time and our hospital finances. The link to this lecture is above if you want to brush up on it. So then we got creative and set out to make this process faster, developing what we call the turbo or fast spin echo sequence, where we made a train of echoes allowing us to increase the efficiency of this process, cutting down on imaging time while maintaining the diagnostic quality of our images. And this is one of the workhorse sequences of modern day MRI imaging. Link to this lecture is above for the details. So where do we go from here? We're still limited in this pulse sequence in that eventually these echoes will die out and we'll have to restart the process as shown here after our fourth echo. The question is, can we make this process even faster? You can almost hear the conversations for how this must have gone. One dark and stormy night, a few daring MR researchers are huddled around a fire, having a few too many drinks when one of them shouts out without thinking, what if we keep these echoes going? If we somehow prevent them from dying out and produce echo after echo until we get over 128 echoes, or even 256 echoes in a row, then we wouldn't even need to repeat this cycle. If we did this, we could generate all the echoes needed to fill K-space and generate an image under a single TR. Well, back then this person clearly would have been labeled insane and committed to an asylum, and the idea of a faster MRI pulse sequence would be lost in the bucket of other brilliant ideas that society dismissed, like the shake weight. But by chance, perhaps another researcher around that fire went home and thought that this is not such a crazy idea after all. And like Watson and Crick, they set out to prove the impossible can be done and cement their legacy in the MRI Hall of Fame. So the first hurdle to clear is time. The longer this sequence goes on, the more and more disordered and irreversible dephasing our spins accumulate, accounting for why each progressive echo is smaller until the signal dies out. So we'll need to shorten whatever we can, starting with these 180 degree pulses. We won't be able to apply them for as long as we'd normally like. And we also need to shorten the spacing between echoes, or inter-echo time as it's called depending on the vendor. And this will help us make sure we can pack in as many echoes in as short of time as possible. But even then we still have this dephasing problem. Our echoes will still fizzle out before all the phase encoding steps can be performed. But what about our phase encoding gradients here? Don't you think we're doing something so extreme as to capture all the data for an image in one cycle that we're also going to have to get creative with these phase encoding gradients, right? And in fact, we do. It turns out we can get really creative with these phase encoding gradients and apply them in a way that we can combat this natural tendency to dephase over time, keeping these echoes strong with each additional 180 degree rephasing pulse so we can keep this process going to over 128 echoes for some sequences in a single cycle. So what do we call this sequence? Well, what's faster than turbo or vanilla fast? That's right, folks, the ultra fast spin echo. Powerful, isn't it? Examples of these ultra fast spin echo techniques include the haste and SSFSE sequences. HASTE stands for Half Fourier Acquisition Single Shot Turbo Spin Echo. It's both fast in that it acquires all the data for an image in one cycle, but also employs a trick taking advantage of the fact that there is a certain symmetry to our raw acquired data, what people call K-space, so we acquire slightly over half of our usual echoes. Why you see this last data point labeled 128 plus? And then believe it or not, we're able to make an educated guess what the remaining data points are and synthesize them numerically. Now I know this makes zero sense how we can just make up data points, and it's not easily explained, requiring multiple lectures that we'll cover in the future, so right now just take my word for it and trust me, we'll be revisiting this haste sequence multiple times as our understanding grows. 
The SS FSE stands for Single Shot Fast Spin Echo. And the name is a little more self-explanatory. But to prevent getting lost in the weeds, just know that both of these can be considered a type of turbo fast spin echo technique where all the data to make the image is acquired in a single shot using long echo trails. This is a form of echo planar imaging, a general term we use to describe a family of very fast sequences. Speaking of, these sequences are fast, able to acquire a whole slice of the body in as little as half a second. Now a lot of you have to be wondering, what's the catch? It sounds too good to be true, and there has to be a downside to doing this or else we would use this technique for every exam. Well, remember in the last lecture on the turbo fast spin echo sequence, we saw how creating these echo trains would affect our contrast, and we had to create this concept of an effective TE. Well, you can imagine that if we push this concept even further and maybe cut corners by synthesizing data, we're going to impact our image contrast and sharpness even more. So let's take a look at one of these ultra fast spin echo images. Not bad, right? And at first glance, you may think this is just as good as our turbo fast spin echo technique. But when you compare them side by side, you can see there's a clear difference between the two. The fast spin echo is much more sharp looking and there's better contrast between the tissues. But in order to acquire it, the patient has to be able to lay quietly in the scanner for a much longer time than the haste sequence. And as some of you know, if a patient is really sick, they may not be able to hold still or even follow commands. So the haste sequence is good for quick looks at the body but are not diagnostic quality. You can maybe rule out something obviously wrong or something that is very targeted such as looking at ventricular size, but there is limited tissue contrast and if you're really worried for an acute process within the brain, you would not bet your health on this sequence even if it looks normal. Our standard and turbo fast spin echo sequences provide diagnostic quality images that you would bet your life on, but can only produce that quality in a patient that can lie still enough during a longer exam. So to wrap this up, you are probably still curious as to how this sequence works. How are we able to make the echo reappear over and over again so many times? And what exactly is going on with these phase encoding gradients here? This is a perfect segue into our next lecture. The Gradient Recalled Echo Thank you everyone for sticking with me for yet another MRI Physics Lecture. Here are ways you can support the channel. Our usual disclaimer on the graphics and animations created by yours truly. And we'll see you for the next lecture. This is Dr. T.E. signing off.